you know, film is always an archive. It's an archive of our time. It's an archive of culture. It's an archive of people, places, and things. And um, this has got to be an archive of how resilient we as Black people have always been and will continue to be. And even amongst moments of struggle, we create beauty and diamonds constantly. Welcome to the final episode of HBO's Between the World and Me podcast. I'm your host, Susan Kelechi Watson. Today, we'll continue to extend the conversation of Between the World and Me. We'll be hearing from three panels from our partner organizations, the Apollo Theater, the Kennedy Center, and the communities from the Shoresman Center at Yale University and Howard University. And we'll also hear from scholar and writer, Dr. Salamisha Tillett. But first, let's start with a conversation from producer Elisa Payne and director Camila Forbes. How do I describe Elisa and my relationship? Um, you know what? I think it is like, I, I feel like, you know, we've been joking at the end of this that we're like Thelma and Louise. It's like yin and yang. You know, it has been, um, and, and, and we grew to that, right? Because Elisa and I, we've known each other now for a year, but it feels like 15 years, you know? The more um, we got to know each other, the more people we knew we had in common and people that have been in our lives for like a long, 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 long time. So like even that alone is just like, oh, wow. Well, it's just family, right? And, and there's implicit trust between the two of us. There is implicit and mutual respect um, between the two of us, you know, I see Lisa shaking her head. So um, <laughs> I'm glad she agrees because it's definitely from my side for sure. And But I feel that from her as well, which is why I think, you know, and that's the kind of relationship I think between a director and a producer that you need. But also there's also, you know, we're both black women in this industry. So there is a, a different kind of level of support that I know that I think we both know each other needs to support one another and push each other forward. Um, to make sure that the other person is seen properly, right? And I, I know that, you know, our relationship has shown that there's a, there's a real intentionality around that. Um, um, and it's nothing we've ever spoken about. Um, it's nothing ever we ever have to speak about. You know what I mean? It's just something that we know. And I think it comes out of that respect and it comes out of really seeing each other. Um, so so that's under it. Um, under Underneath also your typical director producer relationship. Right. Like I depend on her for everything. Right. Um, and vice versa. She depends on me to show up and deliver. <laughs> um, she holds um, holds 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 the baby together um, and, and, and and manages all the pots while they're simmering over. Um, and creates a safe space for for the creative magic to happen. I would say that I'm going to start from where we last saw each other face to face. I said to Camila, you know, I Camila, you know, are we friends? I, I was trying to start there, right? I was you like, Camila, are we friends? Because we have <laughs> gone through this really intense process, and we've been thrown together in a pressure cooker. If you think about it. This idea started in July and was pitched in July. I was officially on the film on July 20th. We were up shooting, staffed up, crewed up on August 6th. So that's two weeks later and going in six city, five cities during COVID. And so that's like a real pressure cooker of a speedy kind of relationship that and we, like Camilla said, we knew each other before, but we just were put into this really intense situation that we had to figure out so many things together in concert at that time. So the answer to that was, of course, we're friends. I think we are like the Black equivalent of Laverne and Shirley. Camilla and I were on the Williamsburg Bridge driving to the um, our post-production, one of our post-production sessions, and she has an important phone call. And I say, Camilla, do you just want me to drive? And then we stop on the Williamsburg Bridge and then we both run around the car. The people are beeping us behind. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we are friends. I think that what I would say is besides my children, I have been the person in my most recent history, and of course my husband, but the person in most recent history that I've been so protective of has been Camila. So as the producer on this piece, one, I am sublimely grateful that she chose me. And I keep telling her all the time she could have chosen anyone to do this. 
I couldn't have. She I could She could have, but, but at, anyway, right? So she could have chosen anyone, but she chose me. And so I'm sublimely grateful for that. But one thing I have made sure and I've tried and I hope that I succeeded in was being the protector of Camilla and the process. Because, you know, there's so many logistical and outside factors, including COVID and legal and everything else that could affect creativity. And what I really tried to do, not always successfully, was to make sure that she was in a bubble and to make sure that she had the room to do what she needed creatively, as well as to give my creative uh, my creative input when she wanted and when she didn't want. Some some of those made it in the film. Some of those Camilla has a way of like telling you no 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 thank you in the most polite ways. But I I think that I would describe our relationship as sisters and friends. And I think that, you know, I have become her protector on a lot of ways. I was saying recently that even in the marketing of this, I am part Camila's publicist, part her producer, part assistant and scheduler, you know, and all of those things. And I am so grateful to have this relationship. Oh, Elisa. The first panel we'll hear today is a conversation with communities from the Shoresman Center at Yale University and Howard University. We'll hear from Natalie Hopkinson, associate professor in the doctoral program in Howard University's Department of Communication, Culture, and Media Studies, and from Jason Moran, renowned jazz pianist and composer, artistic director for jazz at the Kennedy Center, and composer for the Between the World and Me stage and film score. Our moderator for this conversation is Daphne A. Brooks, professor of African-American studies, American studies, women's gender and sexuality studies, and music at Yale University. Greetings, everyone. I am Daphne Brooks, and I'm thrilled to be in conversation today about the film you likely just tuned into. This particular conversation bloomed from a partnership between Yale University and the work between the world and me. Um, it unfolded as an inspired um, kind of project to think more about the arts and civic life and the meaning of Black radical expressive practices tied to not only our own individual well-being, but our families and our communities' well-being and the health of this country as well. And so today we are going to chat with some of our guests uh, from a variety of different places and spaces, culturally expressive points of life in order to think about the significance of the arts and civic life together. Hi, Daphne. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Natalie Hopkinson. I had the great honor of going to undergrad with both ta and Camila Forbes. And this moment is so emotional for me to be here, to see this project to the fruition. I also was friends with Prince Jones. And it's just an amazing um, thing to see this pain turned into art in this way. And looking forward to having this conversation with you. We also have the wondrous Jason Moran. It's good to be here with you, Daphne and Natalie. Um, to be the composer, uh, to, to help make the score for this was a tremendous uh, undertaking, um, but working with Camila was really great because we spent so many years working on the stage production as well. So we're able to think about what what does a what does a theme mean for uh, a pain, uh, and what does a theme mean for for a future, um, unverified future. Um, so this was this was the task that I have as a as a musician, but for one that I'm I took. I took ownership of. It's such an inspiring work, and I had the pleasure and honor of being able to see it as a live production at the Apollo. I'm interested in hearing from each of you what the experience has been like. So I guess I can start. Um, I This work was so personal for me to begin with. I could see the people. I was there at Howard at the 90s. I knew a lot of the main characters in it. And I have to say, um, this the cinematic treatment of it was a little bit more satisfying for me personally, uh, just because I feel like it added another dimension of hope and a, a more dimension of uh, the struggle and sort of honoring the struggle. You know, I found the book 
a little bit, it felt very sad and dark. It was like, it was very hard. Um, you know, especially when you're talking about talking to our children, you know, and giving them reason to like get up and, and, and go to work and keep struggling. And I felt like with this version, there, there's something about the way that, that the, um, you know, ta spoke at the end. There's something about the things that were added um, that really, I just, I, I actually found a lot more reason to cheer and struggle and, and find inspiration. It's very beautiful. I'd be interested in hearing, Jason, your approach to um, drawing out that kind of a reaction from the viewer through the musical choices that you made. Um, but maybe first, if you could share with us your own journey through these different iterations of the work. Um, I remember the, the day, I mean, Camila and I met because we both, I mean, I work at the Kennedy Center as the artistic director for jazz. And Camila was also helping produce um, hip hop productions, hip hop theater productions at the Kennedy Center. And I remember in New York one day she sat, we sat down for lunch and she said, this is what I want to try to do. And, and you know, I think about seminal texts for, for us. I think about... Um, I think about Beloved, or I think about, you know, The Fire Next Time, or I think about, you know, Narrative uh, of a Slave. I think about these texts and what they mean, not like simply as literature, but as libretto. Uh, what what does it mean that Toni Morrison keeps talking about these songs that people sing, you know, or hum in the kitchen, you know? You hear about all of this, but as a reader, sometimes it it still sits far away, but as a musician, it shouts, it just shouts as to the possibility of what uh, a kind of chorus can be. And that's what makes it feel um, so satisfying. And because we we know that we are not original <laughs> in our struggle, um, but that we are a strong community. And these stories have to be said kind of over and over again too. And, um, and I'm down for that repetition. Um, to never act like that, that we have gotten over it or that they have either. You know, I sometimes with my students, we talk about this book as being a book that offers instruction. Um, and I'm interested in the pedagogy of this work as a film, um, how it cares for its actors, but it also by way of its actors, by way of its, visual narrative by way of its sonic narrative is sending out messages into the world that remind us of the ways that the arts can, you know, operate not just as a salve, but as um, equipment for living, as Ralph Ellison would say. And so I, I'm, I'm curious how experiencing this particular iteration of the project um, whether there are lessons or strategies, um, forms of care that you've drawn from being in dialogue with this work now, and especially in 2020. With this version of the film, there is a lot more uh, sense of agency and sense of how the struggle, um, and, and there's a little bit more time spent on that, in that what you do Yes, it is white supremacist. Yes, our country is uh, white supremacist. Yes, these it's rigged. Yes, these things are all true. These historical facts are true. However, why do we struggle? That's that's where I mean. If I'm talking about pedagogy and what I what I'm instructing to my children and my students, even in the past week, this horrific week that we've had, is that everybody calm down. We've been in a long history of struggle, um, and we, our ancestors, have been through far worse. This will pass. Let's, get, you know, somebody took the time to have you raise you. You can do the same for somebody else. This is, you know, we are not. Uh, uh, this is not a sad existence. You know, like I find uh, being black a joyful existence. I find the struggle. You know, I find beauty in it. You know, I find um, there's so much wonderful that I find about the struggle. And, you know, if you come away feeling that the lesson is 
oh, what's the point? Then I think that's a bit, it's, it's difficult. I think it's difficult for especially young people to sort of tease out. I'm so thrilled that I got to speak with the both of you. Um, thank you for your wisdom, for your creativity, for your scholarship, Natalie, and your, and your pedagogy, um, for your artistry and aesthetic genius. Um, Jason Moran, we're, we're so grateful. And um, may we, we carry this work out into the world and, and share it as wisdom with our loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. My name is Salamisha Tillett, and I'm a professor of African American Studies and Creative Writing at Rutgers University, Newark. I'm a contributing critic at large at the New York Times, and I'm the co-founder of A Long Walk Home, an art organization uh, that empowers young people to end violence against girls and women. Between the World and Me made me feel so many different emotions. It captured, I guess, the arc of you know, what it means to, to be a Black person, a Black citizen, a Black parent uh, in this age in which we are dealing with the pandemic and also confronting racial injustice. Watching it and also seeing the ways in which Kamala Forbes was able to render uh, Tanahasi's language in this 3D uh, version, it just kind of I guess capture the intensity of loss and grief on one hand, but also it made me feel proud, um, not just in terms of black resilience, but in the ways in which black people have come together over centuries to project white supremacy and to assert our humanity. Um, but I watched the film a couple of times now and I've just, been shocked and surprised by the kind of roller coaster that I experience, which is another way of saying, um, you know, what black emotional life is like in the United States. What works for me with the film is in many ways, the way it responds to some of the criticism about the book. And so there are two things in particular that stand out to me. One, um, there was a sense among some academics that uh, the book was fatalistic, meaning that uh, Black life was already overdetermined by American racism and it left a kind of pessimism. And I think what the film does is that it really, really tries to f go through the various ways in which Black ingenuity, Black creativity, and Black unity, or at least attempts towards Black unity have always been in service of a larger freedom project. So I just want to say that it's like the most, that's something that really stood out to me and made me feel like hopeful um, and the way in which black art can, can both be a form of protest and also an alternative to the political oppression that black people feel. So it's protesting that and it's also giving us a way out and a way forward. And I think a lot of the small criticism of the book, but important, was the way in which it doesn't really deal with Black women and girls' lives as part of how we think of Black vulnerability or Black death. And so um, the film really is attentive to the ways in which Black women are not only at the forefront of our most pressing and most paramount social justice movements of today um, by featuring uh, Alicia Garza as well as Angela Davis. Um, but it also tells a story of Black life and the tragedy of Black death as experienced by Black men and, and Black women, Black girls and Black boys. And so whether it's a simple thing by saying, dear son, dear daughter, or it's the inclusion of Breonna Taylor's mother's voice after we hear um, this really wonderful performance um, by Felicia Rashad of Prince Jones's mother's, uh, the interview that ta did with Prince Jones's mother. So we have one mother's voice and we have another mother's voice. And these are mothers who are grieving. These are mothers who have lost their children to police violence. 
and yet having them next to each other not only shows us this kind of the continuity of black death in America and black vulnerability, but it also kind of ensures that all of these voices are considered equal. Um, and in this moment in which it's not just about Black Lives Matter, uh, but all Black Lives Mattering, I think it's a really important inclusion um, and a really um, beautiful tribute uh, to the ways in which Black women's grief is the collective grief of the nation. Our next panel is from the Apollo Theater with guests Rich Blint, Abimbola Kokai Lewis, and Kai Green. Rich Blint is assistant professor of literature in the Department of Literary Studies, director of the program in race and ethnicity, and affiliate faculty in gender studies at the Eugene Lang College of Liberal Arts, the New School. Abimbola Kokai Lewis is an educator and ethnomusicologist currently teaching at Park Place Community Middle School in New York. Kai Green is a sophomore at the Beacon School in Manhattan and recently participated in the Young Men's Enrichment Academy at Princeton University. And our moderator for this conversation is Deidre Holman, an educator and doctoral student in the Social Studies Program at Teachers College, Columbia University. Hi. I'm Deirdre Holman, and it is a wonderful day to be talking about Between the World and Me, because the historiosity of this moment um, really ushers in this work in all of its forms um, in a, a unique way. ta Between the World and Me, as you know, takes this title from Richard Wright's 1935 poem, which is really about how the Black body um, in Jim Crow America is vulnerable to all kinds of violence. Abimbola, you've prepared to read a passage of Richard Wright's poem. Would you please share that with us? Sure. And one morning, while in the woods, I stumbled suddenly upon the thing. Stumbled upon it in a grassy clearing guarded by scaly oaks and elms. And the sooty details of the scene rose, thrusting themselves between the world and me. I mean, it's interesting that he, by lifting the title between the world and me, it, there's a diasporic feel to this. There's an internal domestic um, range in terms of what's between the world and me. What's between the world and me, I think Coates is suggesting, is unmitigated violence. Um, in the first part is this kind of structure of coercion and feeling that's about, as he says in the beginning of the book, a certain kind of world for white Americans of, you know, Volkswagens and gardens and varsity dances. And so I think Between the World and Me is meant to sketch that space between the world that you open your eyes on, right, that you're trying to figure out, and then you're very pressing dark black body that somehow can't fully assimilate. And where we've landed now, it seems to me that we have to figure out what are we willing to do to finally achieve our country, as Baldwin says, right? They kind of bridge the gap between the world and me. It was black people, it seems to me, who always chose the nation, you know, what people like to say in platitudes and moments of romance about our better angels, right? It is those of us who are written out, marginalized, dispossessed, who tell the truth and, some, and as you saw in this election, save the country from itself. In Harlem, you're surrounded by many people that look like you if you're um, a black man or a woman. And I feel like when ta coached, when he got older, he realized that the world isn't like that at all. So I feel like in a sense, it's every black father's um, duty to tell their son how to carry themselves in the world, especially if their black bodies are looked as like looked upon as a threat to society. Um, so I saw like many places in the text where um, Ta-Nehisi Coates was telling his son how he should carry himself. And it kind of reminded me what my parents have been telling me and teaching me throughout my life and how I want to represent myself in this world. You know, the thing that was also one of those amazing moments last school year, even though it was during our remote period, was. Mm -hmm 
Apollo had um, free access to the documentary that was airing on HBO. When that link was shared, my students actually watched the documentary as part of a project that we had in the spring. And they could actually see how Between the Worlds and Me was, was part of the fiber of the entire documentary. And there was a moment of recognition where they said, oh, we saw that. We experienced that. So when you talk about the history, you know, it's a living history. And for them to have not necessarily seen the show um, where it premiered, but to see the the children's show, the, the school day live adaptation and experience that, I think that it made a huge impact on all of the students. And when we looked back at the end of the year, going to the Apollo was one of their ultimate highlights. And in a year where we were dealing with COVID distancing and a lot of students who were honestly in their homes for the duration of that time from March to June right. to have those memories and to be able to recall something that was so powerful. It made me feel incredibly happy and appreciative because I know that it's an opportunity that many students may not get. And it's one thing definitely to interact with, with, um, the screen and to be able to, to see it on the screen, but to actually walk into the theater to have that experience and to be surrounded by that rich culture from the photographs to the show, it was, it was really an unforgettable experience for all of us. You know, the initial idea came about because, um, we were all, and and by we, it was myself, ta a bunch of folks. Sue Kay was also on the call. And it came up that, hey, we need to share between the world and me with the world, to the world right now. Like, this is the moment. This is the time. And obviously, we couldn't, we couldn't get people together in a room to tour it. Um, and, and so then became a, a myriad of conversations about, okay, well, how do we, what, what can we do? Um, and, um, and then once you get agents involved, calls were made. That's, that's initially how it started. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Co- COVID, I mean, you know, it's hard for me to, I want to start when I talk about COVID, I want to start to say that we are sublimely blessed to be able to do something like this, right? And so it is not ever lost on me that there are people who have lost family members and have gone through a lot during this time who are sick as they are listening to this, etc. So I want to just stop for a moment and just honor the people who are really struggling with depression and other things during this time. With that said, of course, making a film in COVID times has particular challenges. I mean, if you think about it, normally you have an army of people who would make something like this, right? So, I mean, an army. Even if we talk about unloading a truck of gear, you generally have so many people who are doing this. I pitch. Imagine, like, normally you'd have maybe 10 big burly men helping you to as unloaders, right? And loaders to load trucks. Imagine just two women albeit strong, right? Loading and unloading a huge truck every single day of lighting gear and camera gear. And those are the same people who actually have to work that gear. And so that's just one example of how pared down we had to be. And then add to the fact that you have to be socially distanced. We're going into people's homes. So for me, there was a lot of convincing people that we were going to do it in the most safe way. You know, if you think about it, our cast... Prior to this, most of them were not doing anything. And so this was the first thing they were actually going to be brave enough to do. And we're going into their homes when they haven't even seen some of them. Felicia Rashad hadn't even seen her children at that time. And so she's allowing us, she's allowing us to take us out of her bubble, bring her into a rental space because she played Dr. Jones, so it had to have a certain look, and then have these strangers, our crew, around her, right? And so we have to create so much distance, make sure she has an outside, a different entrance and bathroom and all of that stuff from our crew and make sure our crew is safe. We went through testing every three days. You know, either when the doctor came to me, I said to him, you are you are cleaning my nose out. This is a Q-tips grandfather. Why is it so big? You know, and add that, add the fact that you are have to get meal breaks and restaurants aren't open. You have to figure out ways to cater and feed people. You have to make sure that you have all these types of venues that are not open, 
holding spaces that are not available. There are so many challenges, as well as legal and other things. And also, again, doing all this to not interrupt the creativity, to make sure that Camila still has a way to bring the story forward, to make sure that the actors feel feel like they're in the room with her when she's actually doing it, directing them over Zoom. I mean, I can go on and on forever. The blessings are that we got to make this film. You know, it was the pandemic within the pandemic. I think that it was right on time. The creative, we leaned into it and didn't lean away with it. And so because we did that, it, we were able to create that intimacy and it re- and it resonates in the final product. I mean, you know, look, everything she said, you know, the challenges, right? They they were immeasurable, um, but also provided a, another level of opportunity because, um, you know, because we couldn't, um, you know, we couldn't have as many people on set allowed for a different level of intimacy, right? Because if, if I could have actors together, th- the whole creative concept might have been completely different. And and I think and, and now watching back the film, having several actors or three to four actors in a scene would not would have taken away from the sense of urgency that I think the film has, the sense of nuance that the film has when you're kind of just here super close with your actors and our ability and need to actually lean on archival. Um, we had to um, out of necessity to tell the story. Um but it became such a beautiful tapestry. We had to lean on on and sort of using visual artwork to have another visual layer because we couldn't go out and shoot another 10 days <laughs> to, get, to, to, to get coverage. But it became such a beautiful um, um, opportunity, a creative opportunity. So, so I think with every challenge, we found a new way to find an opportunity to, to get ourselves in. You know, the fact that we, we had to shoot, we, we, we shot people in their homes. Um, not everybody, but because we did, because of COVID, um, it also allowed, there was another sense of like um, closeness, um, comfortability with some of the actors, with, with a lot of the actors. Um, um, do you know that, it, and, and intimacy, the fact that you're in someone's home, there's there's a different level of texture that comes out there that it would have, our, our creative might've been completely different. We might've had them on a soundstage, everyone on a soundstage in a studio, ah, who knows? Um, but but because we were limited, just allowed for so many more actual creative possibilities that really allowed the story to flourish. The last panel in today's episode is from the social impact team at the John F. Kennedy Center with guests Tony Lewis, community leader, author, and champion for children with incarcerated parents. Jason Wallace, executive director of the D.C. Mayor's Office of Fathers, Men, and Boys, a Howard University alum and host of Lyrics and Lattes podcast, and Alicia Garza, principal at the Black Futures Lab, co-founder of the Black Lives Matter Global Network, and performer in the film. The moderator for this conversation is Mark Bamuti joseph vice president and artistic director of social impact for the Kennedy Center, and also a performer in the film. Peace. What a pleasure to see you here uh, in these incredibly volatile times. My name is Mark Bamuti joseph I'm really excited to have a frank, sensitive, and joyously intellectual conversation this evening. Our specific task this evening is to have a conversation about the gender dynamic that that text portends, but to try to do it from an intersectional lens. So what we're talking about today is generation. And if I can expand the conversation a little bit um, beyond um, specifically um, uh, familiar tropes of Black manhood and just talk about um, gender in particular. Um, And this is wide open, but Alicia, I'd like to begin with you. Um, What do you think is the impact of gender on political progress? Um, And that might range from the, you know, the misogyny at the underbelly of the Black Panther Party to, um, you know, uh, queer men like Bayard Rustin or James Baldwin. What do you think the impact of gender is on our political progress? Sure. Well, it's a complicated story, yes. but I think we have to start with 
when we talk about gender, I think we have to talk about the fact that the nation state that we live in is a project that was built and designed for white men. And, you know, as folks were brought here, uh, both through the process of enslavement, mm -hmm. uh, also through the process of, you know, theft, mm -hmm. um, as folks were engaged in the project of building this nation, I think that, you know, what happens when you, um, when you don't allow people to reach their highest potential to achieve their dreams, their dreams get stunted. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot with this election, and there's all this conversation about who won the election and, you know, folks are giving mad props to black women and then I'm seeing, you know, a lot of chaos and, and confusion and pain and hurt around, you know, what did black men do or not do in this election cycle? Mm. And all the way leading up to this, I think, you know, there is a real conversation to be had about um, access. And I started by telling the story of how this nation was built and who it was built for, because I think that even though this nation is no longer, right, um, just comprised of um, white men, and this nation, I think, in a lot of ways has been fought for uh, by more than white men, right? Mm -hmm. White women, black men, black women, across the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. I think what we also see is that there's um, a, a longing that people can't place. And the longing for the ability to do more than survive can often be translated into a whole bunch of longings. Mm. And I've heard uh, in some senses, right, that there is a longing not just to be whole, but what wholeness looks like in this nation state mm. um, is very complicated. Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, when we want to talk about the, the, the impact or the place of gender um, in, in politics and in this political moment, I think the conversation is actually a conversation about longing and what it is that we long for and how we express that through a range of places um, where we identify. Beautiful. Brothers Jason, Tony, any responses? Um, I think I would just say that... I you know, when you look at the power structure, it's particularly in terms of who, strategically, who, who's who been picked to represent us, mm. if you will. You mentioned the Black Panther Party. You you mentioned um, uh, people like uh, Bayard Rustin or whatever. Mm. Like, And at that time, it was it just about, like, okay, you guys can't lead because you're women? Or uh, Bayard, you can't, you know, um, lead the March on Washington, though you designed it uh, because you're gay. Maybe not. Maybe it was like the people that we're talking to, we're trying to get the attention of, you know, the people in power. Who are who? Who are they more prone to listen to? Mm -hmm. um, and so, with that, I think as much as we continue to change who those people are, um, I think we will. We will, and I think we've made some strides. Uh, we got a lot, a long distance to go, but I think we'll start to impact um, who represents us politically. And I, and I think we're in a time. I like to feel like we're in a time where that's starting to happen, mm -hmm. right? Where where we can't continue to try to uh, mirror um, the power structure, and, and we have to just sort of like change it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Reimagine it, right? That that's where we have to move towards. Um, I, I love this conversation of longing and representation, uh, Jason. Wondering if there's a third node that uh, is of interest to you. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned gender in the political process, but you know, diversity is is is, is coming around and not just there, but everywhere. I mean, it's you see it in uh, in, in boardrooms today, you mm -hmm. see it in, uh, in business rooms. It, it's 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 something that's necessary. Like Tony said, like you can't have the same group of people representing us. And I love Alicia's point about, and you know, I'll I'll take it from the the food loop, uh, to the to what it is, to what she said is for them by us. It wasn't designed for us. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't built for us. However, we're, we, we've taken it and we're moving forward in a particular direction where we are represented, where we are included, to where it, won't, it wasn't for us, but it will be for our children. Yeah. I, I will say that as we're recording this today, uh, 
Joseph Biden has been named uh, the 46th president of the United States. We'll see if that holds up. By the time we uh, get to the airing of this, anything is possible in this um, volatile moment. Um, and I'm struck because here at the Kennedy Center in a seat of cultural power, um, you hear the echoes of, um, of helicopters overhead. Um, the, the militaristic aspect of gender performance the, the aspect of gender performance that is about might is something that we've been contending with, um, as Alicia calls this nation state. We've been thinking about that as a way of um, performing strength, certainly since the country's founding. And um, I, I would suggest that it's been something that we've all psychologically battled with um, in these last four years of the administration of this president. And it is without a doubt an undercurrent in ta book, where ta Coates really focuses on the vulnerability and the breakability of the black body, the plunder of the black body and, um, and resource. Tony Lewis, Jason Wallace, Alicia Garza, uh, what a pleasure. What I love about ta book, what I loved about uh, the performances in the movie from Angela Davis to Alicia Garza, Felicia Rashad to Angela Bassett, um, Mahershala Ali, um, and the list goes on. Uh, Michelle Wilson, just um, truly extraordinary performances in service of the work. What is clear in this piece um, isn't so much the pronouncement of gender, but really the pronouncement of ta final words, which is they made us into a race, but we made ourselves into a people. It's so good to be with you, my people, what we believe in. You are the people I believe in. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you so much, Jason. And thanks to you for spending a minute uh, with us between the world and me. You know, I think the legacy of this film is um, what I hope is a reminder of our resiliency and joy, right? Like, um, you know, that we look back on 50 years from now. You know, film is always an archive. It's an archive of our time. It's an archive of culture. It's an archive of people, places, and things. And um, this has got to be an archive of how resilient we as Black people have always been and will continue to be. And even amongst moments of struggle, we create beauty and diamonds constantly. Um, and that's who we are as a people, diasporically. Um, and, you know, that's that's what I hope the legacy of this film is, is um, you know, it really, really shines a light on in the same way that the book has done. Um, and, you know, in the same way the book is, was able to really almost, um, I love Alicia Garza says this, humanize the movement, the BLM movement. Um, we hope that the film um, also does the same to propel the movement forward, to really also become a call of action um, for the movement as well, um, but also a call of action that is um, um, that is that moves people to um, movement, that moves people to act, um, that moves people to shift policy, um, but also that moves people to recognize love and joy and self love and self care all at the same time. So I echo everything that Camila said. I'm going to add another piece. So Tanahasi in the book and in the um, in the film, he says, I, "I would not. I don't want you to be twice as good as them, right?" And but really, when have we not had to be? So I, I think about this film as a a reflection and a uh, personification of that. Think about the circumstances by 
under which we made this film. And I'm like, you know, when Camila says to me, oh, well, no one else could have done it but you, I turn it around and I say, well, who else but Black women could have made this film and this time doing this while facing the different pandem- the pandemic and the pandemic of racism within the pandemic, right? And so, and having to save the democracy and make sure that, that you know, 45 is out. Who but Black women could do that? It just goes to show how much we can do in spite of and despite what we've already been through. Thanks so much for listening to our final episode of the Between the World and Me podcast. I'd like to thank our partner organizations, the Apollo Theater, the Kennedy Center, and Yale and Howard Universities. I'd also like to thank Dr. Salamisha Tillett, as well as our panelists, Daphne A. Brooks, Natalie Hopkinson, Jason Moran, Deidre Holman, Rich Blint, Abimbola Kolkai Lewis, Kai Green, Mark Bamuti Joseph, Tony Lewis, Jason Wallace, and Alicia Garza. Also, thanks to Elisa Payne and Camila Forbes, who created this powerful event. HBO's Between the World and Me podcast is hosted by me, Susan Kilechi Watson, and produced by HBO in conjunction with Spoke Media and Domino Sound. Our executive producers are Elisa Payne, Nolika Radway, Keith Reynolds, Aliyah Tavakolian, and Brigham Mosley. Creative director is Kenya Denise, and senior producer is Alexandra De Palma. Caroline Hamilton produces the show with help from Goldie Patrick, Trey Jones, Alicia Force, and Carson McCain. Sound design and engineering by Evan Arnett, and original music from the film by Jason Moran. Our theme song is by Cohn. If you like what you heard today, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. It really helps people find the show. You can also stream the podcast on HBO Max. Thanks for listening. <laughs>